First, I'm going to start. Um, well, actually, the, the first report that I'm going to talk about in any detail is Bernstein. But before I do that, I want you to take the sheet that I handed uh, out to you. This is a chronology of musical books to date, as far as I've been able to assemble them. Um, now, last time we talked about you know, what is Jewish opera. You can, you can say that anything on a Jewish subject is, is a Jewish opera, but then you have to include Nabucco and Salome. Um, and you can say anything written by a Jewish composer is, is a Jewish opera, but then you have to include 102 works by Offenbach. Um, so we, we're limiting pretty much to uh, works by Jewish composers on Jewish subjects. Um, however, in the case of the Dibble, I found eight that, that fill that bill, and nine more on this list of 17 that are also of interest, even though they're not necessarily opera, they're not necessarily by Jewish composers. Now, the first one that's on the list is by Joel Engel. He was the author of the incidental music uh, to the play, and in 1926, he published a suite called the Book Suite. And the music that he collected, not so much that he wrote, but that he collected, uh, included a melody that inspired Aaron Copeland's piano trio Vitebsk in 1929. And there were ballets made from the Joel Engel work in 1941 and in as recently as 2010. So this music really does live on. It was the first Dibble music. Second on the list is someone named Joseph Chernyavsky, um, who was a jazz band uh, director and performer, and he seems to have written a Yiddish operetta called Der Dibuk. Florida Atlantic University supposedly has an excerpt 178 of one of his jazz band performances from this work, but I, I was down there, we were, not, we were not able to find it. Um, if anybody finds it, I'd love to to hear it though. This is, this, that's number two on the list. Number three is Bernard Sekulis. And this was a man who was a Kapellmeister in Mainz, who apparently wrote an orchestral prelude in 1928. In 1933, he was one of the first to lose his job mm. as a Jew under the Nazis. And he died the following year. Then we come to Ludovico Rocca. Fascinating character who lived quite a long life. Look, he, he lived as long as he died in 1986. How old? He was 91, right? Um, and he wrote five operas. Il Dibuk was the third one. And it was done in La Scala quite successfully in 1934. People hailed it as a successor to Turango, which is somewhat reminiscent of. Um, and in 1936, it had a production in several cities in New York, in, in, in America, Detroit, and, uh, and in New York, Olin Downs panned it, huh. tore it apart, said it's all artifice and uh, uh, flim flam, and, it, and uh, it's, it's just not worth uh, hearing again. And I don't think it's been done in America since then. Although there was a production in Turin, Torino, in 1982, you can watch the finale from it on YouTube, and it's quite interesting. Um, his librettist was Renato Simoni, and historically this is a very important piece, not so much for what it was, but for what it prevented. It prevented two of the most important opera composers in history from getting the rights to this work which they wanted to do. One of them was Alvin Baird, who made application in 1927-28 and was told that the rights were not available. And the other was, and of course Baird was, you know, the, the composer of probably the greatest 20th century opera, Kortzeck. And George Gershwin, whom my teacher at the Seagmaster used to say was the, the composer of the greatest American opera I've ever written, Porgy and Bess, which he wrote shortly after this. He actually had a contract in 1929 with the Metropolitan Opera to write a, a, an opera based on the Dibble. His librettist was Henry, was to be Henry Allsberg. Does that mean anything to you, Henry Osberg? Well, that, he was the translator of the Dibble, the, the uh, version that you used, right? I used totally, and I know it's very good in most cases. Osberg, yeah. Henry Osberg also had a long life. He died in 1970. Um, he's a fascinating character. He wrote for the nation, and um, he 
joined the expedition with Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman to find relics in the Soviet Union to bring back to Moscow for the Museum of the Revolution. By the time they got back, it was changed into the Museum of the Communist Party and all food and storage had never seen. Um, but he was part of that expedition. In fact, he was arrested at one point, going from Odessa to Kiev, uh, and Goldman uh, asked Lenin to intervene, which he did. Um, Allsberg was the translator of the first English language production of the Tipok in New York. And um, when Emma Goldman's uh, autobiography, Living My Life, came out, there were hundreds of reviews, and she said the only ones worth reading were those by H.L. Mencken and Henry Allsberg. So here we go with all these connections. Um, so now, apparently David Tamkin was not discouraged, at least initially, the way Baird and Gershwin were. And he wrote an opera called Dibbuk. He started it in 1932. I'm not sure when he finished it, but 1951 was how long he had to wait for its premiere at the New York City Opera. And there are excerpts from that on YouTube. There are recordings on LP. And um, the uh, uh, Milken Foundation has put out a whole CD of, of excerpts from it. Um, Tamkin was basically a Hollywood composer. He, um, I have his credits here. I've never heard of any of the things he did. Maybe some of you have. But he studied with um, uh, Francis Richter and briefly with Respighi and Ernst Bloch. Um, and he wrote he, uh, music for nearly 40 films including Swell Guy, The Fighting of Flynn, You Gotta Stay Happy. He orchestrated most of the film scores of Dmitry Tjomkin. Um, and he was the orchestrator for Jerry Goldsmith's 100 Rifles. And he did write a second opera called The Blue Plum Tree. Um, so he, he had some of a, something of a following. Um, I, I'll, I will be playing one short excerpt from his work in the, excuse me, in the course of uh, the excerpts that we're going through. Max Marcus Wolf Ettinger wrote a ballet in 1947 called the Dibbuk. And then we come to Gerald Morgulis, whose opera was begun while he was in the army, he told me, in 1956. And 2012 is the completion date, or is it still in progress? It's still in progress. It's still in progress. Because we are looking forward to a production in Moscow when the political situation calms down. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Changing things. Yeah. Joel Mandelbaum's music for the Dubuque began while he was a student at Brandeis and was asked, invited to write incidental music for the play in 1957, so just a year after, years Jared. And then the opera itself was completed in various versions in 66, 72, and 78. There was a Queen's College version in two acts. The original was four acts. Um, and we'll be hearing some excerpts from that shortly. There's also an opera uh, uh, by a, uh, uh, a German composer named Karl Heinz Fussel, whom I met in Vienna in 1980. I was giving a, a, a lecture on uh, Jewish music at the time, and I invited him because he had written this very interesting opera that had been done in um, Karlsruhe. Karlsruhe. He, again, he had started in 58, wasn't um, performed until 1970. He was working for Universal Editions, which published the work, and um, it has some rather interesting music. He's not Jewish. Robert Starer wrote a, a ballet that was done in Berlin in 1960. And then another ballet, probably the most famous Tibet ballet, uh, is by Leonard Bernstein. Uh, and he wrote that in 1974, just at the time that I was completing Italy's first. And I'm going to show you what I think are some interesting parallels. Jeff Hamburg is a relatively young man who Helene and I met in Amsterdam. In fact, we stayed with him when we were touring with EG. Um, and he's written uh, quite, he, he got fed up with uh, the music scene in America and found a home in Amsterdam. There's a lot of, of music theater there and um, quite a bit of Jewish music too. Leon Shidlovsky was originally from Chile, emigrated to Israel. And his Israeli opera, the two book, was done in 1993 there. Shulamit Ram, I mentioned earlier, has this opera which is called Between Two Worlds, the Tibuk. And uh, it was written in 1995 and premiered in Chicago in 1997. We'll be exploring that in some detail. 
There's also an opera uh, that was premiered in Tel Aviv in 1998 by Solomon Epstein, the Dibbuk, and it's billed as the world's first original Yiddish opera, but uh, it's not. I mean, there are quite a few other Yiddish operas before that. One was called Pegil and Bathsheba, which is Porgy and Bess in Yiddish. And another is um, uh, Lazar Weiner's The Golem, which is in Yiddish and in English. And those all predate this, so I don't know why, where they got this idea that it's the first good original Yiddish opera, but um, anyway, it's, it's, it's one that I've, I've been trying to get some information on, I haven't yet found. Um, the very last one on here, Alfred Ben Amos, I've been in touch with him. He's a, an Israeli, lives in Colorado, and his the book of 2002 was premiered in Montreal in 2008. He was supposed to be sending me some music, but I haven't gotten it yet. Um, and then there's uh, the second to last one on here is a ballet that was done in Moscow in 2001 and 2004. It's called Lea. And I don't know who wrote the music. If somebody can help me find that out, I'd appreciate it. The, the, um, the choreographer, though, is Alexis Radmansky, who is now with the New York City Ballet. Ask him. So, yeah, I'm going to try to reach him. <laughs> Just learned about that back fairly recently. So there you have the chronology of 17 musical difficulties.